I graduated from graduate school in 2006. Not one, literally zero of the people I studied in the textbook were black. So once I decided that's ridiculous and I want to change that, I have to expect some pushback. And I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm willing to fight that battle. Like I'm, I'm very okay with people looking at me weird because I took the stage wearing this. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Justice and Power podcast. I'm your host, Nakima Levy Armstrong, and I'm excited to bring forward our special guest on this show. He is renowned. He definitely speaks the truth, and I believe that his perspective will challenge us today. Elliot, could you please more fully introduce yourself to our listening audience? For sure. Uh, my name is Elliot Connie, and I am a psychotherapist. Um, I'm also an author. I've written several books about psychotherapy. I travel the world uh, teaching people how to do psychotherapy, and I hope my work spreads hope and love to everybody. Thank you for that. So where are you from? I'm from, I'm originally from Massachusetts. I currently live in the Dallas area in Texas. Mm -hmm. How did you get started on this journey? You know, uh, I got started on this journey because I had a really like difficult and in fact traumatic childhood and it almost ended my life. Like I was depressed, anxious, suicidal most of my youth. And at some point along the way, I learned the importance and power of hope and it completely changed my life. And I wanted to help people so the, the best way I could see to do that was become a psychotherapy. But over time, it evolved from just helping people, i.e. a person, to wanting to help society and the, the culture in which I come from, the African-American culture, which I think has traditionally shied away from psychological services and getting, getting psychiatric and psychotherapeutic treatment. I want to help. I want to make it. And I understand why, by the way. Like, that's not a criticism to our culture. Psychotherapy was not built for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and psychotherapy as a general rule is not currently conducted by us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as an African-American, it's exhausting mm -hmm. trying to tell non-African-Americans what it's like to be an African-American. And I want to I highlight African-American. I don't always enjoy the term people of color uh, because people of color lumps way too many people into a group. Whereas African-Americans are the descendants of slaves that were stolen and taken to stolen land. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes our experience unique, even amongst people of color. So it became very important to me that my culture, that I could bring a light and healing uh, to my culture. How did you get past the stigma? Because like you said, so many in our community do not adhere to this notion of therapy counseling, psychotherapy, psychology, and like you said, for good reason. How yeah. did you come to the point where you could overcome the stigma and then become a healer, a teacher, a counselor in the way that you are? You know, to be, to be honest with you, I think a lot of us, we, we are stigma overcomers anyway. Like, Nakima, I, 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 having just met you, I'm, I'm not sure, like, I don't know your history, but I'm willing to bet you went through some of the same things I went through. Like when I was in high school and I went to college, like some of my friends were like college boy, white boy, like all of these things. Because we, as, a, as an African-American culture, we, we think about these things in terms of white and black. And it, that's not how we should think of them. So I've been overcoming stigma all my life. So this was, this was nothing new. My passion is to help this culture. Mm -hmm. And I am willing to deal with whatever I have to deal with along that path. Mm -hmm. And there are times where I say things and I upset white people. There are times when I say things when I upset black people. But I'm not trying to not upset anybody. I'm trying to tell our truth mm -hmm. in a way that leads towards progress. And I, let, I read a book by Nelson Mandela. It's a fantastic book. I actually don't remember the name of it. But it's my favorite book by Mandela. 
and and a reporter followed him for a year and wrote 10 like leadership rules of Madiba. Hmm. Uh, I've got the book somewhere laying around here. It's a beautiful book. And one of the things Mandela said was you have to be willing to upset people when mm -hmm. you take a position of leadership. And he used examples of when he got out of prison and he spoke to the white South Africans, he upset them. But he also said, when I spoke to the black South Africans and I asked them not to be violent, they were upset. But he knew it was the right thing to do. And there are times, I'm not worried about the stigma. I'm not worried about whether I'm upsetting people or not. I know that y'all need to hear this. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's, it's something's going to push our culture forward. I love that. And it seems like it would be a, a liberating, although daunting position, right? To just essentially speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may, because you feel you're pursuing your life's calling and your mission of helping the culture. So I, I just applaud taking that approach. It's a similar approach as the one that I have had to take to do the work that I do. So I applaud you for stepping forward and just Letting the chips fall where they may. Yes. Now, yeah. let's let's go back a little bit. In your introduction, you talked about how the journey that you're on actually saved your life because yeah. of the things that you went through. Yeah. I can imagine that there are people listening who have gone through trauma, drama, pain that has been inflicted upon them, and they have tried to figure out a way of coping and navigating through those various obstacles. Now, from my understanding, you have a process called solution-focused brief therapy. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about solution-focused brief therapy and how it, what is it, first of all? And then how does it differ from traditional therapy that people may seek? Sure. So first of all, you're correct. Like going down this path has legitimately saved my life. And I mean like, I'm on this earth still because I found this, because I think wow. sometimes when you go through something so traumatic and painful, if you don't give it a purpose, it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. And this became my purpose to try to spread healing because I had discovered healing in my own life. And I wanted everybody to know about it, especially people in our community and of our culture. And while I was in graduate school, I learned about this approach that was called that is called solution focused brief therapy it was developed 40 something years ago uh but it was it's an underrepresented practice in the field of psychotherapy but when i was in school this was the only form of therapy that made sense to me like to answer your question how is this different than other approaches most forms of psychotherapy are about trying to understand you and or your problem and giving you a suggestion to overcome that problem hmm. and Think about that in many contexts, like that's a very difficult thing to do. And it causes me to experience pain because in order to talk about your problem, you have to remember pain, trauma, struggle, difficulty. You have to remember really hard things. And when I went to school, I didn't want, when I was in graduate school, I didn't want to go to therapy and talk to somebody about my problems. That shit almost killed me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about my future because the most beautiful thing about the human experience is your journey is more important than your origin. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to talk about my origin. I wanted to talk about my journey. I wanted to talk about where I was going. And now I didn't know anything about therapy. You know, I, I just, this is what was in my head and everything I read about in graduate school was all about people's origins. Like, Tell me about your childhood and, you know, all of this stuff. And then I came across a couple of pages in a book. Like, literally, it was a book about a bunch of ways of doing therapy. And a couple of pages were about this thing called solution-focused brief therapy. And I was like, holy cow, like, this is what I've been thinking. Like, this is, this is that thing that I've been thinking about. And I was on fire. I was like, I, I, gotta, I need to learn more about this. I need to do this. Now, fast forward, because it was kind of an underrepresented part of the field, I started writing books. And before I knew it, I was the leader in this field. And now I'm the most hired speaker. I have the biggest following. We have the 
largest training organization dedicated to the field. Not every like status quo 70 year old white male loves that a black dude in a hoodie is running the field. But that's what's happening because I, I just love this and I'm so on fire to spread it everywhere. Yes, I love that. So you saw a couple pages. I saw a couple pages. Yes. That is incredible. Yeah. It was a it was a book. Literally every chapter is about a different way of doing therapy. And chapter 13 was mm. about four different ways of doing therapy. One of them was solution focused brief therapy. And it was two and a quarter pages. But it was the it was the first time I'd read anything. And I thought, this is how I want to talk to people. That is incredible. Talk about linking up to your destiny. Facts. And yeah, just seeing the pathway forward. And now look at all the fruit that you've Absolutely been able true. to bear as a result of following that pathway. So tell, her, tell us more about how this works. Solution-focused brief therapy. Because you talked before about what traditional therapy entails in terms right. of having to dredge up problems, trauma, talk about it openly, which is, like you said, very difficult right. for a lot of people. And not to mention, sometimes you take the lid off that jar, it's hard to close it back up. Almost impossible. Yes. And people dread going through that kind of a process. Yeah. A hundred... so how does this process work? A hundred percent. Okay. So the way this process works. So traditionally, if you come to standard status quo therapy, the first question you're going to hear your professional ask you is what brings you into therapy? Mm -hmm. But we would never ask that question because that, that's an origin of the problem question. We're going to ask questions like, what outcome are you seeking? Because mm. that's about the journey. That's mm. about where you're going. Again, your journey is significantly more important than your origin. Mm. So we ask, what outcome are you seeking? And people say things like happiness, sobriety, whatever. And we start having a conversation that moves their lives in that direction. Now, the other thing I will say is it's a very resource-oriented way of talking to people. So, for example, you, my friend, are a very educated woman. And I know, as a Black woman who went to law school, you have experienced some obstacles on your way to achieving your education. Mm -hmm. So if you came to me and you said, Elliot, I've got a problem, I really want to stop drinking, for example. Mm -hmm. I would say to you, can you tell me every skill and resource you have within you that allowed you to become a black female attorney? Mm -hmm. And you'd say things like, I'm strong-willed, I'm smart, or whatever. You'd make a list of the things. And then I would say, if you applied those skills, traits, and resources that you have within you towards achieving sobriety, what would you notice? And it starts to activate like the most awesome part of you mm -hmm. to accomplish a problem, to accomplish a solution to a problem. One of the biggest mistakes, I think, of human behavior is we don't generalize our greatness, but we do generalize our flaws. Mm. So there are a lot of people that are like, I've got this flaw, so I run late and I, and I drink too much and I overeat and whatever. But then like they're lawyers or doctors or professional athletes great fathers, great mothers, whatever. And if you generalize your greatness, then you would just apply it in multiple areas of life. And part of my job is to remind you, again, fictitiously, if you came to me because you had a drinking problem, my job would be to remind you, you are so awesome that you overcame every obstacle in your way to becoming a Black female attorney. If you applied that awesomeness to accomplishing this next thing, what would you notice? And then people start truly stepping into and walking into their greatness which is my like addiction like i am i am here on this planet to help people walk into and step into their greatness not even close like that is, that is why i'm i'm on earth that sounds incredible i almost wish you were in our classrooms to be honest with you right because i'm thinking about our our young people our babies you know our children who are in school every day and their greatness is often diminished because of the way that things are structured, because there's not usually space to bring out their greatness, their creativity, the power of their imagination and what they're capable of. 
So I can see these same principles and asking these questions and helping students realize how resourceful they are, how resilient they have been, what they've already overcome in their young lives that can equip them for overcoming in life, period. So, you know, you know, what's funny is I actually think that's. That's part of our hero story. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that the system is not built for us to flourish and thrive, and yet we flourish and thrive. I yeah. think we need to ask ourselves as a culture and as a society, how are we doing this? Because mm -hmm. I think it's really impressive. And I think it's really worth noting. We are in a culture and society that is not designed to bring out the very best of us, but yet we keep showing up at our very best. Yeah. And I, and I think that is a testament to how great our culture is. I agree. Whatever is in our DNA, I'm grateful for it because right. yeah, me too. Absolutely right. And not only do we keep showing up as our best selves in the midst of what we're going through, but I think about how we influence things on a national and a global level, even though we don't get the credit as Black folks. We influence every aspect of American society as well as world society, world, uh, world history. I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. So let's talk a little bit about your philosophy when it comes to parenting and <laughs> the importance of talking things through with our children. Now, I'm a mom. I have four yeah. children. My youngest is five. My oldest is 26. So I have a range of kids, right? And I know that they're each individual and they have their own personalities. As a parent, I sometimes grapple with the appropriate way to maybe discipline my children to make sure I'm not, you know, being too stern, giving them that flexibility and that freedom, but also making sure that they know that I know that I'm their mom, that I gave birth to them, that I have certain expectations in terms of, you know, how they, how they present themselves and just, you know, what they have going on in their lives. So what would you say to a parent who is trying to determine the best way to relate to their children, to also discipline their children and the approach that, that we should be taking. Well, okay, so I have a multi-layered answer to this. But the first thing I want to say is, like, we have to remember, like, you are the parent. You are the authority. And we have to be that in our children's lives. Like, I... You are the leader, you are the authority, and you are the person they will observe, learn from, and learn how to show and receive respect. Mm -hmm. My biggest concern is in the Black culture, we are parenting with the legacy of slavery. Mm. My biggest concern is we parent as if the child has no voice. Mm -hmm. And we parent coming from that legacy where we use physical like discipline to teach a lesson. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not telling you I'm against physical discipline. I think that's every parent's choice. But what I am saying is think about this for a second. I don't want you to think logically about what I'm about to say for a second. If I am a 12 year old child and I am sitting on my couch playing my PS4 with a headset, talking to my friends, playing Madden, which is a football game, if anybody doesn't know. And then my mother or father walks in the room and they, says, they say, stop that and go do the dishes. We should expect the 12-year-old to, to not want to do that. Mm -hmm. But in, in the era in which I grew up, if I were to say anything other than yes, ma'am, with enthusiasm and excitement, I'm being disrespectful and I would get hit. Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying, why do we do that? I'm simply asking, is it not time that we divorce ourselves from the legacy of slavery and parent with our intellect and understand that I just asked a 12 year old brain to turn off a video game where they got a headset on playing with their friends? And I asked them to do something super boring, like mow the lawn or do the dishes or sweep the floor or whatever. We should expect them to not like that. And we should give them bandwidth 
to express that because that's how we parent. Mm -hmm. In order to teach someone that they have value, we have to learn to listen to them. Mm -hmm. The most important thing you have in this world, the most precious commodity you have in this world is your time and your attention. Those are two things that we cannot get back. Mm -hmm. And in the black community, we have a tendency to tell our children, you are not worth my time and attention. Shut up and do what I said. Instead of, let me explain to you why it's important that you do what I said. And, and if they sigh and roll your eyes, feel free to punish that too. I'm not saying accept it. I'm saying expect it and not understand it as disrespect. Understand it as this is the child learning how to use their voice learning how to communicate that they don't like things. Now, I'll say that, and people are like, oh, you're trying to parent like a white person. No, that's not true. I'm trying to parent divorced of the legacy of slavery. We have to start thinking differently because, look, we hit our children at a much higher rate than the white culture does. And when you say this, is, oh, you parent like white children. Well, white children learn to respect authority without being hit. Why can't we stop thinking about it as race and start thinking about one culture being influenced by slavery and another culture not being influenced by slavery? And why can't we give our children the gift of the greatest commodity we have, which is our time and our attention? And why can't we let them practice their voice on us? The greatest compliment our children give us is actually talking back because it means they think you're safe enough to practice using their voice before they have wisdom and discipline to use their voice well. That's a really big deal. But yet we just think they're talking back and disrespectful and we literally beat that out of them. Mm -hmm. But I know as an African-American, our young babies, they have to be prepared for a very harsh life. And I want them to feel value. I want them to feel strong. I want them to feel at the height of their self-worth because this world is going to try to teach them they're not worth what their others are worth. Mm -hmm. And that to me is heartbreaking. So that being said, thank you for unpacking that. That was really helpful in terms of understanding your underlying philosophy. How is it possible to parent divorce from the legacy of slavery when we know that society is not divorced from the legacy of slavery. So I remember just in, in church, for example, you know, where the pastor would be preaching. He's like, listen, spare the rod, spoil the child. If you beat them, they won't die, right? Like these are literal things that were spoken to the congregation. And essentially, if I'm, if I'm unpacking what I think that that particular pastor meant, they're talking about teaching your children a level of discipline and understanding in order to protect them from what they're going to encounter outside of your home. So for example, when you talk about children using their voices and talking back, for example, what happens if your child you know, practices that with you at home from 12 to 16? At 16, you know, they're able to get their permit or their driver's license, and then, God forbid, they're pulled over. How do you reconcile what has been taught to the child in the home in terms of speaking up, using their voice, having some leeway, and what they might encounter when they, you know, get pulled over by a police officer who just wants you to comply, comply, comply? So I think that's part of what, especially being um, a mother of a teenage young Black man, right, that I'm trying to reconcile in my mind. I'm sure I'm not the only one as a parent. For sure. So first of all, I think this is a, a beautiful point and an important question. Uh, first thing we have to acknowledge is beating our children does not keep them alive. And our evidence of that is we're dying all over the place now. Number two, we like, I remember watching a video of a black man literally with his hands up, sitting on the ground, and they shot him. Mm -hmm. He was literally on the ground, 
he was caring for a disabled person, disabled white person. Mm -hmm. So they thought. I remember he, that. They thought yeah, he was. I remember that. Right. They thought he was breaking some law. I'm not even sure what stupid law they thought he was breaking. He put his hands up. They asked him to sit down and he sat down just like this and they shot him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to recognize that our compliance isn't making us safe. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not advocating for us talking back to police or any other authority. What I'm advocating for is that we understand our value. And I think that starts in the home and that starts young. And I also think we need to stop taking responsibility for these in encounters because it's not our fault. And there's nothing. My mother is a black woman, obviously, and she raised three black men, right? Me, me and my two brothers, all male. There are encounters where we encountered the police and we couldn't yes sir or yes ma'am our way out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about what are we teaching these kids? Now we have this weird belief, like if we allow our children to talk back, they're just gonna talk back to everybody. No, I'm not saying allow them to talk back. I'm saying expect them to talk back and not misconstrue that as disrespect mm -hmm. and parent it. They're going to learn how to respect authority, but do not think that the black culture is in danger because of the black culture. The black culture is in danger because we are feared mm -hmm. and police officers shoot at us and police officers choke us and police officers take liberties with our bodies that that doesn't happen with other cultures and we are not responsible to that like that's that's not our fault i have seen videos of murderous black white men like white men that were caught on the seat of the crime murdering people going after the police violently and they were not handled with mm -hmm. deadly weapons mm -hmm. like as as sean king often says these videos are evidence that police know how to do it. They just don't do it with our culture. So I think it's twofold. I'm not saying allow disrespect. I'm saying, or allow talking back. I'm saying expect it. And it's not your children being disrespectful. It's your children practicing using their voice. And that gives you the opportunity to parent it. So they learn wisdom. So they know when to speak up and when to not. So they learn when to advocate for themselves and when to not. They learn that they have value and worth. And they learn when to assert that value and worth and understand that I can be pulled over by the police today. I'm going to the airport. I can be pulled over on my way to the airport. I could follow every command with all of my business success and degrees and still be murdered. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, one of the things that I'm thinking through that other parents might be thinking about is what happens if your children genuinely are being disrespectful when, yes, you might expect it, but at the same time, what do you do if you don't want to tolerate it? If you know that, for example, the tone or if they're, you know, just <laughs> yelling back and doing a lot, you know, as you're just saying, hey, can you, I want you to come wash the dishes now or I want you to go mow the lawn but they're giving you a heightened level of energy that does I want you to do it. or border on being disrespectful. What would want you, you say to parents in that situation? I want you to parent it. I want you to punish them. I want you to coach them. I want you to influence their behavior. I want you to intervene. People misunderstand me saying expect it to allow it. And that's not what I'm saying. If your child stands up and says, I don't want to do those stupid dishes, feel free to punish that child. I'm not saying allow it. I'm saying we need to allow our babies to use their voice. Absolutely. Instead of shutting it down. Like when I was growing up, I was not able to use my voice. And think about this. If I grew up in a household where I'm constantly being told, you're just a child, stay in a child's place. When I'm 22 and I get my first job and my boss mistreats me, do you think I know how to stand up for myself? Do you think I know how to use my voice? No, we have to let our children practice that skill. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree with it. I think practicing that skill, but also with the caveat, right, where we're educating them about yes. what happens in society 
uh, you know, about if they go into the classroom and their teacher asks them to do something, that's a whole other can of worms that they're going to have to contend with because of this thing that we call the school to prison pipeline, where that's unfortunately true. many schools have police officers on staff. They're known as school resource officers, and they have become the de facto disciplinarian in a school environment. And so if a child does not comply, for example, with what a teacher may ask, that teacher could pick up the phone or use a walkie-talkie or whatever and call in a school resource officer who then has the full power of the law behind them. Correct. Whether they handcuff a child, rough up a child, I've seen it all in terms of what has happened in these settings. So I do think that ensuring that our children are using their voices is of the utmost importance. But I also think that having that caveat where there is intentionality behind explaining, you know, what can happen in these various settings is, is very important as well. well. That's, a, that's exactly what I'm saying is we need to have that caveat. I completely agree with you. I think people misunderstand exactly what this point, which is expecting and allowing are two different things. Mm -hmm. We have to parent it. But there were times in my childhood where I was out. I mean, we didn't have, you know, the crazy technology kids have now. I'm 46 years old. So I was, you know, generation before. But I would be outside with my friend playing and having a great time. And my, my mother, you know, come in the house. And I come in the house and I've got to like sweep and mop. And I'd be like, oh. And I would get hit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a logical response. I was having fun. And you asked me to do something not fun. Right. You so should you coach try me. to be disrespectful. Right. I was not trying to be express disrespectful. Express yourself like any person would in a situation like that. Correct. But because of the legacy of slavery and us maybe as black parents needing to be taught differently, the knee jerk reaction it could be getting a switch or a belt or whatever and and being physically beaten. And one of the things that really offends me, as, a, as an African-American, I have experienced the last few years politically is extraordinarily troubling. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really offends me, and I know this is one of those things that's like legacy of slavery type things, but like when there is a police murder of an unarmed black man, a lot of people on Facebook, the first thing they say is what did this person do? Mm -hmm. But they don't say that about white arrests. They don't say, did this black person comply or not? They don't say that. I don't care what George Floyd was doing. I don't care what Eric Holt, like, I don't care about those things. The crime they were committing, if they were committing a crime, did not come with the death penalty and their lives should not have been taken in that moment. Right. We don't even have the death penalty in Minnesota. But that's what I mean. Like, but we ask ourselves, was George Floyd complying? As if his non-compliance should lead to his death. Right. That's, we don't ask that about white people. And that comes from way back in slave days, if mm -hmm. something happened to a young boy, they ask, what rule did they break to upset so-and-so? Mm -hmm. like, so it's the psychological conditioning. Correct. And I'm just still saying... Experiencing today, because again, the systems that surround us and the people who control a lot of those systems have a great deal of influence over our lives and our feelings of liberation or lack thereof. Right. And I'm saying, let's break this pattern. Let's mm -hmm. take ownership of our own behavior and our own culture and our own society and understand we need to grow up with value and worth. And that doesn't put us at more risk. It actually makes us significantly more safe. Mm -hmm. Well, I know one of the other safeguards that some may feel is a safeguard, although I have mixed feelings about it, and that's the child system of child protection, that where you, you do have some Black parents who feel that their power to discipline their children has been taken away because of, a, you know, child protection getting involved if someone does physically discipline right. children, for example. So that's one thing we've seen happen. But I think on the flip side, what we see is that parents feel that there is a lack of resources available to them if they no longer 
want to physically discipline their children, right? So let's say that they they subscribe to your perspective and they're like, you're right. I don't want to put hands on my children in any way. I don't want to whip them. I don't want to, you know, hit them. But then they're wondering, well, what do I do if I'm talking to my child and it's a repeated pattern of them, you know, talking back or expressing their disdain for chores or, you know, doing homework or whatever it is, what tools can parents utilize if they're at their wits end with regard to trying to manage their relationship with their children? They can use every tool. I mean, they can still spank. I'm I'm not I'm not in I'm not advocating for no physical parenting. Um I mean I own, I have my own personal feelings about that, but I I acknowledge every every parent gets to make that choice. They can take privilege away. They can do all the things everybody else can do. I'm simply saying, sit down and tell your child why. Mm -hmm. Like sit down and explain to your child why it is so important that they learn to respect authority. Tell your child why it's so important as a parent. Because look, as a child, I had no earthly clue why I was given chores. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. Now, in my adulthood, I can look back, it makes perfect sense. But as a child, it wasn't explained to me. Mm -hmm. And explain it to the, to the kids. Mm -hmm. I because think make, that makes it, sense. That makes it, a lot of sense. It'll make sense to them. Mm -hmm. And they still have to do it. Again, do not confuse me saying expectation is not the same as allowance. Right. I'm not saying allow disrespect. I'm just saying expect it. And as right. a parent. Prepare yourself, right? Mentally. Right. right. Wow. If you know this is how they're going to respond. That's then right. Be prepared with the response that's maybe more measured. You've thought through if this right. is going to happen if this happens versus that's right. That's just, right. and uh, the way the the way that we have been taught, which is absolutely. like automatic discipline in that moment. Absolutely, and I remember a huge. And remember, give your children the gift of your attention and your time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking like I sometimes when professionals like me say that it's like, you know, play video games with the kid, like spend time. With them. But I mean, like sit down and look them in the eye and communicate to them. I remember my mother was a single mom. She her and my father divorced young and when I was young. And uh, my mom, I don't remember a time where my mother didn't have at least two jobs. Most of that time she had two jobs and she was taking classes at, you know, some college to get some degree of some sort. And I remember. My mother came home, I'll never forget this day. My mother came home and uh, my job was to clean the bathroom. I hated that job. Mm -hmm. And she came home and she went in the bathroom and it was an absolute mess. And she just started crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she explained, like, I really needed you to do the bathroom. And she mean, you didn't. And I'm super overwhelmed and all these things. And I said, like, but, but help me understand. And she explained to me, she said, I want you to grow up and be responsible. Mm -hmm. She said, um, you are the most responsible of your two siblings. So I give you this task and I really need you to do it. I have to leave the house at 7, 7 a.m. I don't come home until about 9 p.m. And when I come home, I'm very tired. And it's a huge help to me when you've done your chore. And it wasn't a lecture. It wasn't her being angry. She wasn't yelling at me and she wasn't spanking me. She was conversing with me at the age of 10 or 11, whatever age I was. Mm -hmm. I never complained about doing the bathroom again, ever, because wow. I now understood the context mm -hmm. in which this chore was important to her. And I never complained again. I'm only advocating that we talk to our children mm -hmm. about what we're trying to build within them. I love that. I wish that that perspective was shared across <laughs> these various systems, like I mentioned before. Well, that's why we're talking. That's why we're that's why we're doing what we're doing. Absolutely. Now, what happens in a situation in which someone has experienced trauma, like what we were talking about in the beginning, or is still in a lot of pain, or has gone through a lot of drama? How do they get to the point where they can self-diagnose and understand this is what is happening to me? This is what I'm still dealing with. What steps would you recommend? that a person like that would take? I, I wouldn't, that's a, that's a really good question as well. I wouldn't think about it in terms of self-diagnosis. What I would say is if you're struggling with something, go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, 
and go talk to somebody immediately and go talk to somebody that's not a friend. And if you don't find help, go talk to somebody else. Like, don't just give up. Like, you might have to see a therapist or two before you feel like you met that person that you can experience healing with. But, you know, we've gone through a lot as a species, you know, like human beings, we've gone through a lot. Like, when you were born, struggle was guaranteed. Joy was not. Mm -hmm. So we go through a lot. And it is perfectly reasonable that every now and then you need help to get through things. So I wouldn't even worry about self-diagnose. If you're having a hard time, go talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Like human beings heal through connection. So go talk to a professional that's there for you, that wants to help you heal. Mm -hmm. So with regard to the professionals that you work with, if someone were to come to you saying, hey, I don't have a lot of extreme situations going on, but I want to make sure I'm maintaining a healthy balance, healthy outlook, cultivating joy. Who would you send them to? Are there people in your network who are trained? Yeah, um, like I I run a large company where where I train people. And if I couldn't see them, I'd send them to somebody within my network that could. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the cultural competency piece? Are all of the psychotherapists that you work with African-American or and if they're not, have they been trained in terms of understanding our culture so that they don't do more damage? Yes. Well, no, they're not all African-American. Yes, they are trained to understand your culture is not the dominant culture and you have to learn to listen to other cultures through other lenses, for sure. Mm -hmm. It's something that on my team, we spend a lot of time talking about. Mm -hmm. So have you heard feedback from African-American clients or those that you've referred to white psychotherapists that some of those barriers have been broken down when they interact with them for sure um in my the ones in my network that i'm connected to for sure i've heard feedback of the opposite when when people go see a white professional and they feel oppressed judged and biased against uh but that does not happen in my team we we work very hard to understand that even like as a male i work hard to understand that I don't know everything about being a female. Mm -hmm. As a cisgender person, I don't know everything about the LGBT community. We are very culturally aware, and we spend a lot of time talking and focusing on it. I love that. And how accepted is your work in the broader field of psychotherapy? Because we know that it is, it has not been welcoming historically to African-Americans and those who focus on race in particular, you know, and talk about our history. So how has that worked out for you in terms of coming forward with your approach and just the confidence that you have? Like, I know this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. This works and I want to share it with the world. Yeah. So how, how do you bring that, those things into alignment? You know, it's been, it's been a struggle. But my, my work is very accepted in the field now. There was definitely a push to not accept it just because they weren't used to the package looking like this. Mm. And in, in one hand, to be very honest with you, to be completely blunt, I understand that. They're so used to, you know, the white guy with a gray beard down to his chest, wearing a, wearing a scarf in June, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, Hi. they're they're so used to the package coming a certain way. And then here I come you know, listening to Jay-Z and taking the stage, wearing a hoodie and, and that I is think... dope though. I mean, I just gotta just, I, that's just dope. But I'm, I'm sure you just shook some minds. I did. Up to that stage. I did. And a bit of grace I will give to some of these people. I don't think they knew what to do with me. And I think they defaulted to doing what they do. What, what sometimes what privileged people do is oppress. And they learn very quickly. I ain't the one. You better bring a snicker bar if you if you plan to go against me. And over time, I just built a massive following and th they age and retire and go away. And and now I now I run things. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a struggle, but it was a struggle I'm happy to endure. I think when you are dedicated to change, you have to accept. Goes back to what I said before. If I'm dedicated to helping my child grow up, I got to expect talking back. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean disrespect. 
Mm-hmm. Once I committed myself that I want to change this field. When I was in graduate school, think about this. I graduated from graduate school in 2006. 2006. When I was in graduate school, not one, literally zero of the people I studied in the textbook were black. Not mm. one. Mm. I'm, I'm not so, well, there's this one. No, there were zero that's people outrageous. that were black. Mm-hmm. So once I decided that's ridiculous and I want to change that, I have to expect some pushback. Right. Like, I just have to expect it. And I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm willing to fight that battle. Like, I'm, I'm very okay with people looking at me weird because I took the stage wearing this. I'm very okay with that uh, because change requires people being uncomfortable. And human beings, when we get uncomfortable, we often try to do something to make us comfortable again, even if that's asking the black man to shut up. Mm. Uh, but I had to realize this is just part of the journey. So let's do it. Wow. It sounds like you're shocking minds and forcing them to engage in a different way as well. You know, well, yeah, but, go ahead. But we, what happened is I became inignorable. Like as much as they wanted to not have me do keynotes at their conferences and speak at their events, the audience was like, that dude's dope. Like we want to hear from him. And my following is so big, they couldn't leave me off the faculty of these events. So they had to deal with the truth, which is this guy's right. We don't, we might not like the package and we might not like the way he says it, but we can't ignore him because the truth defends itself. Mm -hmm. And I was telling the truth. And saving lives in the process. Facts. Right? Thinking about the people who would, under the traditional approach, who would have to, again, unpack years and years of trauma, baggage, things they tried to forget about, and the harm that that causes, as you mentioned earlier, versus taking a more present-minded and futuristic approach. Correct. Brings about more hope. Right. That your circumstances can change and you don't have to stay stuck and mired in what you experienced. Correct. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And we also we need our babies to also know you don't have to stay stuck and you don't have to get good at sports or rap to get out. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually use your mind. You can get educated. You can become anything and you don't have to give you don't have to give up your culture like you can still represent where you come from and change your entire life. You can change your whole family's lives with your mind. That is incredible. Now, how can people get in touch with you or learn more about your work or join your huge following of folks who are learning from you on the daily? I would love that. So I have an organization called the Solution Focused Universe, and you can join the Solution Focused Universe. Just go to my website, which is elliotconney.com. And you can find me on I'll social. Spell out your last C O N N I E. C O N N I Elliot, which is two L's and two T's. Connie, C O N N I E dot com. Uh, and you can also follow me on social media. Just look for at Elliot Speaks on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. I have a YouTube channel, which is Elliot Connie Speaks. But you can you can find me, and I I would love to have everybody know about my work and know what we're doing. It's all love over here. And I want to yes, make sure, I that want would to make sure be wonderful. And I urge our listeners to definitely look you up, fo- follow you on social media, support your work, comment, share insights, and show up where you are. Yes. You can see some friendly faces in those audiences. I would I'm love that. I would lots love now. That. But love just having much. everyday, ordinary people who care about what's important to you and who can become ambassadors for the messages that you're spreading, which I think is really, really powerful. I'm personally grateful that you decided to go on this path, that you stay true to your calling and that you've broken barriers. And like I said, ultimately have saved lives in the process. Is there anything that you want to end on in terms of sharing with our listeners that they can take and marinate on and process and then apply in their daily lives? Here's what I would say is, Being black is a gift, and our legacy is one of strength, not oppression. And it is okay to divorce ourselves from the difficult habits of the legacy of slavery. Mm -hmm. Uh, Be bold and brave enough to recognize we don't have to do it just because that's what we've always done. 
we can actually think. Our forefathers went through that so that we could think and experience freedom. And freedom doesn't just mean I can walk freely about the land of America. Freedom means freedom of thought. And I think we, we need to spend more time being thoughtful about what we do and who we are. That's what I, that's what I would like to end on. I love that. More brilliance from Elliot Connie. Thank you so much for Thank you. to join us on Justice and Power. We appreciate you and hopefully we can stay in contact with you. I hope so. Please, let's stay connected. Thank you.